Has your dog been diagnosed with cancer? Do you want to know more about the ketogenic diet? Stay tuned. This episode is all about that. Welcome to Dog Happy, where we create happier, healthier dogs one interview at a time. I'm Misty. In today's episode, I talk with Paul Raybald and Patrick Wardell from the Keto Pet Sanctuary. If you haven't heard about the Keto Pet Sanctuary before, basically it was a sanctuary in Texas that was set up to see if a ketogenic diet along with standard of care could help dogs with cancer at all stages of cancer have a better survival rate. And truthfully, the information that they've gained over the past six or seven years has been amazing. You are definitely going to want to stick around and hear what they have to say. Even if your dog doesn't have cancer, if if your dog has any allergies and any inflammation, um, autoimmune diseases, and maybe even behavioral. Basically, we take you right from what it is, why you would want to use it, and how to implement it. You will have all the tools and links in the show notes below, but if you go from start to finish in this episode, you will be ready to rock and roll. So without further ado, let's go ahead and welcome Paul and Patrick. How are you guys? Doing great, Melissa. Thanks for having me on. Same. Yeah, thanks for having us. Oh yeah, I'm excited. So we're going to talk about what Keto Pet Sanctuary is and um, the amazing work that you all have done there for, how old is the Keto Pet Sanctuary now? 2014, so about seven years coming up on. (laughs) I I gotcha. (laughs) I was counting on my fingers. (laughs) Yeah, started back in 2014 and uh, here we are today. Yeah, what I find really exciting about the work that you've done is not only how much it's benefited cancer, um, but it also how much it's really just dove into um, the benefits of a different way of feeding other outside of kibble and the, the norms. So you are helping dogs live longer and happier lives, which is absolutely what I'm looking for with my pets and the podcast here. Through nutrition specifically. But we also touch on a lot of different things. Um, We are first and foremost, just sort of health and nutrition nerds. So we're always kind of looking into the newest and most interesting aspects of life extension, optimal living. Uh, And yeah, and and, and, uh, we we have a lot of different recommendations for dogs, but our our cornerstone is really nutrition. That's wonderful. Yeah, I think people are going to find that um, very eye-opening. So yeah, like I said, we launched in uh, 2014. This was when ketogenic diets were really first coming around in the human space. Um, When people like uh, Dominic D'Agostino, who we all are a fan of, um, were researching ketogenic diets in humans for a variety of conditions. Um, One of the really interesting things about dogs and nutrition research is that you do get 100% compliance because you control their diets. And there's also no placebo effect. So you really get to see the truth of what's going on. And that's, that's a really cool aspect uh, about working with dogs. Um, so we set up a, a ranch that you'll see on the next slide in uh, Texas. And we actually had a PET scanner. And that's the gold standard um, imaging device in humans. And we had it uh, set up for the dogs. So we would adopt dogs with terminal cancer diagnoses. Um, take them in, put them on a ketogenic diet, image their cancer um, regularly and and just see what happened. And and what we saw was some pretty amazing things. And can you explain what a PET scanner is? Yeah. So tumors do something really interesting. They rapidly ferment glucose. It's a really inefficient way to make energy, but for some reason that's what they do. So in order to image cancer and figure out where it is in the body, what you do is you inject radioactive glucose and the glucose gets absorbed by the tumor cells and rapidly fermented. So when you put somebody in the scanner, which picks up the radioactivity, you'll see exactly where that tumor is because you'll see its metabolic activity. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah, it's used in um, human medicine a lot. Uh, Post-emission tomography is called. So it's used in human medicine. It's not used in veterinary medicine. So... um, I think about maybe three or three, maybe four veterinary schools have it, but it's a very expensive machine, but it was very important for us to have this machine, getting dogs from shelters and rescues. We had to see that they actually had a cancer, which was malignant and not benign, you know, just a, a tumor that wasn't cancerous. For those dogs, we made them better and looked after them and got them adopted out. But uh, the PET scan was extremely important So before we move forward, let's step back just a second. So Keto Pet Sanctuary came about 
as a way to test this theory in a species that would be more compliant with the diet and what the other treatment options like the hyperbaric uh, chamber or was it mostly a diet focused type of um, not okay. experiment but uh, endeavor to look into how it could benefit the dogs? Sure. So if, if you back up to, to our staff, the other gentleman that's not on the phone, Ron Penner, he founded, co-founded Quest Nutrition, the human bar and a company that they do chips and, and drinks and pizzas and all sorts of things. Him and I got together because we're both dog lovers and thought, well, wait a minute, what could we do for dogs in the nutrition space? Ron read about the Warburg theory, Otto Warburg, back in 21, I think it was, Patrick. I'll let Patrick explain Dr. Warburg and his um, theory. Okay. So that was early 20th century, I believe, where Warburg discovered the exact effect that I talked about earlier, that cancers for energy, they, they don't they don't do what normal cells do, which is take one molecule of glucose and create 32 ATP from it um, through glycolysis and Krebs cycle, which is efficient. Instead, they take one molecule of glucose and ferment it and create two ATP. And because it's so inefficient, you have to use a ton of glucose and you're pulling that from blood sugar. So with, when we're talking about cancer, we're thinking, okay, cancer needs sugar as fuel. They need a lot of it as fuel. If we can suppress blood sugar, then we can really deplete the fuel that's available for the cancer. Now, the problem with that is if you suppress blood sugar artificially by injecting insulin or something like that, you can have a lot of detrimental consequences. But if you eat a ketogenic diet, you can actually live with a very low blood sugar because you're using those ketones for fuel. So the ketones are available for healthy cells, but not for the cancer cells. And the cancer has um, a depleted glucose supply because of that ketogenic diet. So that's the theory in regards to cancer. Um, and as we'll see, as it turns out, having lower blood sugar and higher ketones does a lot of other positive things. Um, and that's, that's why we were seeing so many amazing things in humans, but nobody was really looking at it for dogs. I mean, when we started this project, nobody was even sure if a dog could enter ketosis. So it was really to answer a lot of questions and say, hey, this, this diet works really well for humans. Canine biology is not too different. Let's see if it's also great for dogs. Oh, that's big, fantastic. Yeah, big push for me, Melissa, just quickly was when I was a child, our dogs used to live into late teens, maybe up to 20. If you can get a dog to 10 years old, people say, oh, it's so cool. It's, so, it's just crazy. They, yeah. they, they, they're losing, we're losing our dogs far too young. I talked to a lady the other day. She had a nine-month-old dog that had cancer. I mean, it's ridiculous. So that was the push for me. Wait a minute. Why can't our dogs live till mid-late teens and beyond? Um, they used to. Yeah. But the other aspect is that our dog foods are now so full of carbohydrates, which are the sugars that you're talking about that feed this Warburg effect, right? Where the, the cancer cells will take up the glucose sooner. Now, what, Patrick, one thing that I wanted to ask is, so where do ketones come from? So ketones come from uh, fat metabolism. So they're, they're byproducts of fat metabolism and they can be used as fuel units um, just like glucose can be used as a fuel unit. Okay, so with a ketogenic diet, you're lowering the amount of carbohydrate that you're giving the body and you're asking it instead to use fat as fuel. Mm -hmm. So you're yeah, just changing yeah. the fuel sources. Yeah, and that's an important distinction. A lot of people think that a ketogenic diet means you're running solely on ketones. You're just adjusting the balance. So you're always going to have blood sugar. It's not like your blood sugar is going to zero or else you will die. Um, you, you do need some amount of blood sugar, but you don't need this incredibly high blood sugar that most people and most dogs are walking around with. And, and one of the points I, I'd also like to make, I guess two points that I'd also like to make earlier rather than later, um, ketones work as fuel units, but they also have a lot of other downstream effects. Um, and, and that gets a little more complex into the science. But if you look up, you know, positive effects of ketones, you can find all sorts of studies on other downstream effects as ketones, not just as an alternate fuel source. Um, the other point I want to emphasize is that dogs actually don't have a nutritional need for carbohydrates. So that's one of the stark kind of shocking things that, that really led us to do what we do and to study if that is in fact true. And, and we determined that, yeah, we don't think dogs should eat carbs. They don't need them. Um, it's pretty apparent to us that most of the reason dog foods are so high in carbs is just because they're really easy to manufacture with. Yeah. Patrick has more of a science background than myself. When you talk about the two fuel sources, you have 
glucose, and then you have ketones, and why it goes up and down. And I know we're not cave people, but back in the day, isn't it right, Patrick, if you didn't eat or you couldn't eat, glucose would drop, ketones would go up kind of thing. Yeah, and that's probably one of the reasons people find so much benefit from intermittent fasting or another thing that's popular is OMAD, one meal a day. Um, you're going to have ketone levels. Now, we're not necessarily advocates on the human side, or I'll speak for myself. I, I, don't, I don't tell someone if they want to live an optimal life, they need to be in deep ketosis all the time, right? There is some amount of fluctuation that can happen. Um, and that's totally fine and natural, but, but Paul's exactly right. So the, the way that your body developed and the way that your metabolism developed was not eating several meals a day. It was, oh, we got, we got some food. We're going to eat. We're going to gorge ourselves, and then we'll, we'll probably find our next meal in a day or two. Um, you know, not since the invention of modern ag agriculture, which is fairly recent. So um, sorry to have gotten you guys so far off of no, no, it's good. off no, it, It's helpful. Let's, uh, let, let's just go back to HBOC because I wanted to, yes, we did hyperbaric oxygen with the dogs. We actually used Dom uh, to uh, his lab to test the e efficacy. Did it have an impact on cancer or not? We didn't conclude that it did or didn't, so we actually took it out of the protocol. What, what it did do, of course, a lot of these dogs we got were kind of beaten up and cuts and bruises and had operations. It did clean them all up for them, which was great because um, you know, the dogs looked healthier, they were healing better. Okay, so I'm gonna go down. Yeah, so here is the PET um, device, and that is cancer imaging before and after on the so the top is the before and you can see the radioactivity there indicating uh looks like pretty large tumor bulk there this is cali so some metastases and then you can see on the bottom that those are no longer present so i've always wondered when i've looked at these um these scans on the one that you all are saying is clear i still see material glowing here in red yeah. and green what is that because there's going to be glucose uptake so those are the kidneys right there Okay. And how come they don't use PET scans more often? Um, is it really expensive to take a scan? It is. So this particular unit costs us 50000 a month and it's just, it was just too, but it was just too expensive. Okay. And so this scan was of actually, this is actually Callie and we'll meet her on the next slide, right? Yeah. So she was the first dog. Is that right, Paul? She was the first graduate, right? Yes. So you can see her story here. She had about six weeks to live in terms of her prognosis. Um, she had a hemangiosarcoma, which is actually the number one killer of dogs. And this is this slide is up to date. Callie is still alive, what, seven years later after that six-week prognosis. Uh, so this is, this is a pretty amazing story. Mm -hmm. I was going to say Callie was pregnant when we got her. And we thought she had a lot of puppies. She didn't. She had um, Angio and one puppy, which we saved, and Kelly got to wean that puppy, and the puppy was adopted out. But Patrick, I'll have you explain what a Mangio sarcoma is. Yeah, it's just uh, fancy Latin prefixes, prefixes and suffixes. Um, so it's, it's endothelial tissue it, it, where the cancer arrives. It can be anywhere in the body. Um, and that's just kind of how cancers are named and classified is based on their tissue of origin. So it's, it's, I don't hear that much about hemangiosarcomas in humans, actually, but in dogs, um, for some reason, it's, it's, I think, the number one killer, as I said. And yeah. she's still alive. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, she is. Yes, yeah, she is, which is great. And, uh, you know, hemangiosarcoma is, is a big killer of dogs. Why? It metastasizes quickly. Why does it do that? It typically grows around the spleen or the stomach, so it gets mm -hmm. picked up fairly quickly. Easy access to the to blood supply where it can move around. Yeah. Right. But I think it might be worth, Patrick, because I, I have this all the time. Why, when you go to the vet, can they say it's cancer or not cancer? Or they're not sure, but they think it's cancer. And the difficulty, one of the difficulties is that needle aspirate. Mm. And so you explain why it's so difficult, Patrick, to get into the well, cancer yeah, cells. You, you need to make sure you're getting just cancer cells and not other cells. So it's it's if you see a tumor, like maybe you see a skin tumor that's very obvious, that'd be pretty easy to aspirate. But if you have a tumor that's in a difficult to reach location, you really do need to biopsy in either in order to confirm the cancer. Um, the only way to really confirm the cancer, um, whether it's malignant cancer, is to, is to send it to the pathologist and, and they can look at the cells and identify it um, through a lot of different testing. Isn't there also a problem with, uh, like, you have to hit the right spot sometimes, or would a hemangiosarcoma 
have only malignant cells in there if it were a cancerous tumor? Or could you actually get um, some normal cells from the, from the needle aspirate? Yeah, yeah. I mean, cancers are, are pretty weird and, and heterogeneous environments. There's a lot of stuff in there. There's, it's a mixture of um, sort of different cancer lineages. It's not just one uniform cancer cell. I mean, one of the characteristics, the most defining is that cancer mutates rapidly, right? So you'll have different colonies of, you know, that all came from the same kind of um, malignant cell, but they'll look a little different and you'll have healthy cells in there. You'll have immune cells, like I said, of all different types. And um, yeah, it really kind of takes a, a pathologist to, to identify that. Oh, that's great. Um, so back to Callie. So she had hemangiosarcoma. Did you all remove that or was it just the diet alone that, that created the success? No, it, we removed it. So at Ketopet with our veterinary staff, the protocol was just the ketogenic diet, ketogenic diet and standard of care, you know, with radiation and chemo or all the way through to resection. So we cut out Callie's uh, um, sarcoma, the, the, the tumor. Of course, the problem is that, have you got clean margins? Are there still cancer cells in there? So right. yes, she did have it resected and, um, and she's still with us today. I forget how old she is now. She must be getting on. She must be like eight. I think she's eight. It does speak to the point that that I do think a ketogenic diet should be like part of standard of care. I mean, our message is not like ketogenic diet cures cancer, but if you're if you have a dog, I think ideally they should eat a ketogenic diet as a preventative measure and a measure for optimal health. And if you have a dog with late stage cancer, I, I think it's going to be beneficial to place them on a ketogenic diet um, because I, I think it really does a lot to inhibit metastasis, the setting up of new cancer colonies where they don't quite have the blood supply and they need all the fuel they can. And if you can suppress that glucose, it can really help. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I'm using it for my own dogs because I have some odd symptoms going on and I'm like, you know what? I can't figure this out. I just need to try and bring inflammation down. With um, Callie, you rem removed the hemangiosarcoma, but did she have chemotherapy or anything like that? Or is that not a type of cancer that responds to that? Was it just surgery? That's a good question because it doesn't respond to chemotherapy, but a lot of vets do it. <laughs> so, um, are there certain cancers that do respond to conventional treatments, and others that maybe you're on the fence about? Certainly, hemangio, in terms of chemo and radiation, it doesn't. We've been told by veterinarians and other scientists that it doesn't do anything. I mean, and we have vets that do it because the, the the owner expects them to do it. You've got to do something. Um, right which, um, you know, is a whole other story. But in terms of, um, that's a good question. Patrick, do you know the answer to that one? I, I don't, to be honest. Yeah, I think it would depend on the specific cancer. But the idea to me is if you want to do everything you can, a ketogenic diet is a no-brainer, uh, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean you shouldn't do things on top of that. Um, that that's not our message at all. Um, right. And it would just depend on the specific case. I, I don't, I don't have an encyclopedia of knowledge in terms of um, the stats on like what 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 responds best. Um, I, I know that it, it tends to follow along tumor type, so I, I think usually you can find trends depending on tumor type. Um, we do have a lot of pet parents to come to us, so we we get a dozen or more pet parents that come to us new every day and ask us questions. And the most common thing is, um, you know, I would say half of them, which is really, really encouraging is, Hey, I heard about, I heard about the diet. I want to get started. Right. And they just got a new dog, something like that, which is what I love to see. Um, but a lot of them still come because they got a cancer diagnosis and that is how they discovered the ketogenic diet is, is by looking up, you know, where we started. And for those dogs, there are some dogs that just implement the diet and don't do standard of care oftentimes because it's, it's so late stage that, you know, they say, just go home and spend time with your dog. And we do hear positive turnarounds from, from even late stage like that. So um, the, the, the takeaway for me is basically, if you want to give your dog optimal nutrition, you'll feed them a low carb ketogenic diet. Yes, there is a clear philosophy and mechanism of action for um, increasing the percentage that you can prevent or um, have success uh, against a cancer. Um, there's no guarantees or anything like that, but um, in terms of positive actions you can take for your dog's health, I, I think the evidence is clear. Yeah, I had my mom had cancer and it used to drive me crazy because the oncologist would say, 
oh no, just eat your fruit and eat your carbs. And (laughs) yeah. And I would think that even anecdotally, any kind of reduction you can do in the amount of glucose available for those cells would probably um, give you some leg up. I'm sure as you all do your research and others, you know, do research, Dom Diagostino and all the groups that kind of are around that, we'll find out more as we go. So yeah, it's um, an open question. And yeah, this yeah. is very new, you know, ketogenic diets have not been studied extensively until, you know, just a, a handful of years ago when, when, when people started. And, and now if you follow keto science on Reddit or anything like that, I mean, there are, there are dozens of studies results being published every day. So th- this world is growing rapidly and exponentially in terms of what we know about the diet. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. There's a lot of things that I, I, I hear the potential for. Um, and it's nice, especially with the Keto Pet Sanctuary you were just trying to see if you could make, if this would work in dogs and this would be a a viable therapy moving forward. And that's really great because a lot of times you don't see that um, for the dogs. You see it in human medicine, but not really for our dogs. So can I go to the next slide? Yeah. Okay. So this is a much better uh, representation of of how to read these charts. I'm not a, a radiologist, so this is very helpful for me. (laughs) <laughs> and and all of viewers. So yeah, yeah, confirmed uh, PET negative. So what that means is uh, they didn't identify um, any cancer on that PET scan after uh, 120 days from that first uh, initial scan. That's really wonderful. And that's important because a lot of times you'll debulk a tumor, you'll cut out the primary tumor, and then, you know, four months later, you'll see the metastases grow. And ironically, actually, sometimes debulking the tumor can can result in a worse outcome. Um, Because you kind of fuel those metastases and now you have multiple primary, you know, multiple larger tumors around the body. So seeing this is really encouraging. And I think it speaks to the aspect of ketogenic diets really helping with the metastasis part. When you say debulking, it's when you go in to take a tumor out and you really can't get that clean margin or anytime you touch it, you almost release cells throughout the body, right? And yeah, those cells seed. Yeah, so you can release cancer cells. The other thing is the cancer matrix has a lot of growth signals because there's a lot of um, immune cells in that matrix that, you know, cytokines are growth signals and they release a lot of those. So sometimes if you don't get clean margins, you can actually create a more aggressive tumor, but um, that's a bit of an open-ended topic. So we can ignore that for now. <laughs> but no yeah. black and whites. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everything's gray with science. Yeah, it's a shade of gray kind of uh, podcast. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> Um, All right. So let's see here. So that first point, you'll see a chart um, on the next slide, but we can just go through these three really quickly. So the first conclusion, which is really important, ketogenic diets do work in dogs. You can reduce blood glucose and you can raise ketones. So you can put a dog into ketosis, which is important. And uh, the first conclusion of, of our work with Keto Pet. And then, yeah, we believe it is the optimal diet for a variety of reasons. Um, Dogs don't need carbs, so it makes sense that you wouldn't feed dogs carbs. And if you measure blood serum, you can see a lot of positive biomarkers. Um, And then, of course, cancer. So we've we've seen, and again, anecdote is something we come back to, but we have binders and binders of stories. and, And Paul and I get emails from pet parents every single day with amazing stories. And I know that some people like to see more formatted research, but it, it's hard if somebody comes to you with a dog with cancer to say, sorry, you're in the control group. Please do not feed your dog a ketogenic diet. Please feed them cereal. It, like, it, it's just, it's not that practical in the real world. So what we have is a giant population of people who all went with the diet and a giant countless number of amazing stories. So we've seen cancer, epilepsy, we see seizure control um, in certain dogs, and we see any any sort of inflammatory conditions like allergies, itching, scratching, hot spots. Paul has firsthand experience with, with those in, in his dogs as well. And um, yeah, it's just, it, it's a pretty um, amazing thing to open an email inbox. I mean, I have 600 red messages in my keto pet inbox. I can open that right now, and I bet you five of them are amazing testimonials. That is wonderful. But I, you know, I, what I really love about this diet also is if you, if you want to prove it to yourself, just try it. Mm-hmm. Not, not one part of this diet would cause harm to any dog. There are, there are, of course, of course, it's not black and white podcast, right? It's gray. So there are yeah. probably instances where you wouldn't want to use it. But if you have a dog with any kind of inflammation or cancer and you want to <clears> see <throat> what kind of health benefits you'll get, just implement it. You'll, you'll start to see the health benefits of it within what, a couple weeks? 
Yeah, and what we can do is uh, we can go to the next slide and look at the glucose, and then we can tell you sort of, um, as you said earlier, what the what the best plan is if somebody wants to to start on the diet. Yeah. So this is a, I mean, this to me is sort of the the cornerstone of the results here. Uh, this is average blood glucose on a kibble diet and a ketogenic diet, and you can see that uh, the the kibble diet is about fifty percent higher, which is pretty amazing, and that's yeah. just average blood sugar circulating. That's, that's a lot. So what happens with that extra glucose that's circulating in the blood of a kibble fed dog? Uh, more of a complex question. There's some negative things that circulating sugar can do. Um, I would urge people to do a deep dive into that if, if they want to learn all the different um, negative aspects of high blood sugar. Um, the cancer aspect is very easy to right. see, but um, Yep. So this is just a quick outline of a ketogenic diet. Um, adequate is spelled with a Q and not a nine, but uh, you can just ignore that. <laughs> so yeah, this is this is um, you know pretty straightforward. High in fat, moderate in protein, very low in digestible carbs. Okay, so it's not a high protein diet. It's a there's a balance to the ketogenic diet that creates the ability for the body to form ketones. Correct. True, true. And there are levels to ketosis like there are to anything else. Um, personally, see, I, I think low carb is the most important. And then the fat and protein balance kind of depends on your situation. Um, personally, if I'm training more, more physical activity, I'll increase my protein. And because I'm burning a lot of calories, I, I can, you know, maintain ketosis with that, but it really depends. Okay. And I'll, I'll probably come back to that. And just a, once we talk about actually implementing the diet. So um, let me go. So what do we have here? And this is from our friends at uh, ketogenic.com, which is um, just like a really easy uh, infographic that shows how you get uh, ketones for fuel rather than glucose. Perfect. Melissa, I should jump in. Unless Let Paul, do you want to comment on a slide? No, no, I'm good. Just a, just one thing <clears throat> that we should touch on. So keto is a fad. Yeah. Mm. Since 1921, it's been a fad potentially. It was just, you know, they used it. Johns Hopkins for children with epilepsy back in 1921. It's, it's become a fad because celebrities are using it, but it, it really isn't a fad. The bottom line is just get carbohydrates out of your diet. You know, that's, um, that, that's yeah. what we're all about. Because one of the first things people see, and we hear this all the time, they fed you food, went keto, and this is like within a week. My dog's not scratching as much. The fur's looking nicer. He's not chewing his feet or her feet. Um, so th th it's interesting what carbohydrates do to you and, uh, and your dog in terms of negative um, consequences of feeding high carb diets. So um, I think the bottom line is, for me anyway, low carb diet and, and keto uh, would be the second. People get, humans have a tendency, oh, ketogenic, well, that's new. Kim Kardashian's on it, so it must be cool. <laughs> so then it gets a bad name and a bad rap. Oh, this is dangerous. So it's not, it really isn't. It's been fed to humans for, for many, many, many years. Right. They've used the, for, so for seizures, you tend to go a little bit higher. But actually, before we go there, so say my dog has just been diagnosed with cancer. I come to your website. Um, you actually have a, um, I'll show everybody here. Um, you actually have this keto pet um, booklet that you can um, download. It talks about what the keto pet sanctuary is and how you came about, but it also talks about how to implement the diet, right? Mm. So yeah. you, it's, it is an instruction. You don't have to figure it out on your own. And your website also has a calculator, right? You put in, I just go there, I put in my, the weight of my dog and how I want to um, prepare the food. We'll talk in a minute or two about the visionary pet foods, but if I want to put it together myself, then you email me the breakdown, right? So I would yeah, you'll get the exact. Um, so if you come to the site, there's a calculator link, and this is something we call option one. So our protocol has changed a little bit over the years. Okay. Um, and this is this is going to be a standard ketogenic diet that we recommend for all dogs. And if you wanted to do a higher fat ketogenic diet for a dog with cancer, that's still the diet that you want to start with that option one, um, just to get them onto a ketogenic diet. 
if your dog has cancer or epilepsy or some serious condition that you think they need a higher fat diet, then you should email us um, info at ketopetsanctuary.com uh, and we'll give you the, the link to another calculator that is higher fat. Um, so the calculator, we were getting a lot of confusion. We used to have a calculator that had all the options together and pretty much everybody that used it would email us like, hey, what do I do? So we had to separate them out and create a calculator that was exclusive to having to request it from us. Um, so that that's, yeah. And the ebook outlines that protocol. So most people read the ebook, go to the calculator and then email us for the, for the second calculator if their dog's dealing with cancer. So you want to start at the one at, at option one um, as yeah. just a transition. If I'm using it for cancer, am I going to want to move to option two at some point? Yes. Yeah. So okay. you do two weeks at option one, and then we recommend four months stretches. So you'll do four months at option two, and then you'll stop and kind of evaluate what's going on with your dog. You know, are they still dealing with the cancer? Um, if so, then you'll go back to option one for two weeks, just to up the protein a little bit, and then back to option two for another four, four months. And, and we, we outline all this when people contact us. So, oh, it's nice. really so, so you thing. can go, okay. Yeah. And in the calculator, like you said, there's, there's two ways you can do it. So when we first started, we had just the homemade aspect and the email that we would get is what can I buy? What can I buy? And there really wasn't a way to do it. So that's when we launched visionary pet, which is a prepackaged line of, um, all sorts of types of, of ketogenic low carb foods. So we have freeze dried, dry food, frozen, um, all, all, whatever you would need. Um, but you can make it at home as well if you want through the keto pet calculator. So you basically just, if you choose homemade, then you have some ingredient options, really easy to make. You can go to a grocery store, um, or you can choose prepackaged and, and do it through visionary. Right. I just got, the, I put my stuff in the keto pet calculator for option one under, um, choosing 80, 20 beef. And basically it sent me back. I wanted to feed the, my dog, Batman, X amount of grams of 80-20 beef <laughs> and then um, X amount of broccoli. It actually didn't have, um, even though I chose butter as the fat option, it didn't include it. Is that because he's already a little fat and I had, chose, <laughs> I had chosen that option as the body type? No, so, so that's a common question we get. So the diet that is created by that calculator is about 69% fat um, as a percentage of total calories. 80-20 beef already is about 72% fat oh, okay. as a percentage of total calories. So when you add the vegetables, it just takes that down to that 69% level. So had you chosen the turkey or chicken, those are a lot leaner meat sources. So then you would need to add the fat source. And that's why we just have you selected. That's perfect. Um, since we're talking about a calculator, I know that um, a lot of people um, can't see how many carbs are in their food. And uh, I will actually link a calculator here um, for everybody that um, Animal Biome has on their website where you can put in the, um, oh my gosh, what is it? Protein, Guaranteed. fat, moisture, ash, and it gives that to you. Would a calculator like that also be able to calculate out um, like a frozen raw patty or is that based only on dry matter? Do you know? So just as a guess, <laughs> I'll say this, you could guess and you can estimate pretty well. The only way to know the carbohydrate content of your food is to send it to a nutrition lab for analysis. Um, the guaranteed analysis is a very general outline and it's very confusing and it's listed as minimums and maximums. And that's because there's always a fluctuating range with production. And um, so it's not going to give you the exact amount, but you can kind of eyeball it with a calculator like okay. that. It should uh, work. If it works for any guaranteed analysis, it should work for any product that has guaranteed amount analysis because moisture content should be included in there. Okay. And then with visionary pets. So if I come to you and I want to do say frozen raw, can I get option one or option two? I mean, do you have levels like that or is it all, is it just a base? And then if I, as I move up for whatever disease process I'm trying to treat, do I just add supplements to that or, or extra stuff? Yeah. So you're, you're getting to the difficulty of automating the process for everybody's unique case. And that's why our email inbox is so busy and, and really the best place to go for anything. So okay. the pre-packaged result will spit out the dry food as the result, because that's the easiest and most affordable food and the one most people pick. But if you come to us and say, Hey, it said to feed a cup of dry food. I want to feed the frozen from visionary. We can convert that very easily. Oh, nice. Nice. And the macros are consistent on our products, so it, it's very easy. There's no need to add anything. 
And when you were doing testing, is there any, did you find that there are other foods out there that were pretty close or is it, I mean, like the commercial raw or because they include fruits and vegetables, are they already higher in carb count than you would want on a ketogenic diet? So, um, yeah, that's a good question. So with keto pet over here, if we had a list of six low carb keto foods, we'd offer them. They weren't out there. So um, the, the, one of the reasons is uh, I sort of visionary pet, we started visionary pet. The keto pet, it was taking us four hours a day on food prep. So we thought, well, let's try and make something that didn't take four hours a day. And then people were saying, oh, that they'd, they'd make the diet at home. And I've made it at home. And you think, oh, and you, and you think it's easy. You know, it's just some meat and some veggies, put it together, make a patty. Is there something commercially we could buy? So that's why we we learned we launched Visionary and and to your point many many of the the, the, the closest company out there is Bones and Co. In terms of keto, uh, you've got Keto Naturals. I think I think they're, yeah, they're out there too um, doing subscription services. But no, most of the healthy food has got fruits. It's got root vegetables full of sugar. Um, so, and if you have a pet with cancer, you want to make sure that if you're going to invest your money in a ketogenic food, if you can't guarantee that this is going to be exactly what I think I'm buying, then, I mean, that's why you would definitely want to go with visionary pet or somebody who's got, is giving you out the same exact information that you're also providing to pet parents, because you have a human grade label on your food, right? It's super easy to read. Is that correct? It is. It's very simple. We have a very simple deck. We do. Uh, we do have the nutrition facts panel, just like a human food would, and that's that's exclusive to us. Nobody else really has that. But um, yeah. Uh, so I just want to jump back before we get into vision because I want to wrap up Keto Pet. Where are we with Keto Pet now? We have the fifty-four acre ranch in Texas. It's now closed. We've got a new ranch in California, um, which we're. We're deciding what Keto Pet 2.0 will be. We did enough research, validation of the diet. I mean, we're the only pet food company that spent millions of dollars validating a diet over several years on hundreds of dogs before we decided to launch a pet food. So no one else has done that. So, yeah. I mean, we, these dogs, we spent about $100,000 each on each of the dogs. All the dogs that survived were adopted out and forever homes and we feed them and, and um, you know, over a period of time they pass, they all have forever homes. The new ranch, we may or may not have dogs, it may become more of an educational. This is what we've learned and then we may invite people to the ranch to teach them about keto pet, teach them about the ketogenic diet, low carb foods, more of an educational piece. Uh, and we have a, a wonderful community online, mm. and this is really important for your, for your listeners, viewers. Um, our Keto Pet group is self-regulating, which is great. And there's, how, how many have we got on there now? 50,000 people? That's yeah, there's lot. something like 50,000 on. That's the Facebook uh, Keto Pet group, and that's, you have to ask to join it. Um, you'll get in, and, and yeah, we, we, we self-moderate it. So we have some members that are really active in there that moderate it. And yeah, it's a thriving community. I mean, we're, 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 we cannot be experts on every single aspect. So it's amazing to have people in there that have experience it, with everything. It, it's 5,000. We have about 60,000 in our whole community. I think oh, okay, are, got you. Yeah, yeah. The group's about five. That was my mistake. Um, but it's a nice group because you have someone, you can imagine a pet parent, they have a dog, they learn about cancer, they panic. Where do they go? They go into the group. You can bet your life. Anybody within that group has had the same issue and problems that the new person coming into the group is asking about. So it's a really cool group so that's why yeah we'll direct people to the group sometimes if we don't know the yeah. answer because some people will ask about a supplement that we haven't directly studied and we'll say you know we don't uh, know yeah. but you can ask the group yeah yeah well that's the nice part about it. i i'm part of the group and i i really like being a part of it um and i actually had a few questions about the group so when you see within the group people saying well you should go here and have this person calculate this diet for you with all the AFCO nutrients 
do you feel like that's necessary with the with the work that you've done? Do I need to go um, and make sure that this is complete and balanced every day? Let, let, let me, there's, there's two things I always say to people. One of them's kind of flippant. So the flippant one is, when's the last time you heard of a, you know, a pack of wolves running into an eye or a cornfield and devastating the corn crop? Never, right? So um, that's the first thing. The other thing is it's food. Your dog has cancer. Just feed this food and treat the cancer. It is balanced nutrition it, and try it. And the good thing is people within the group are going out to their veterinarians and now Patrick's just put together, it's only been out a few months, we have a veterinary locator on the Keto Pet sites. That's brand new. So and they're both holistic veterinarians, which you would expect, but also allopathic veterinarians. Mm -hmm. How many, we have about 90 people on there now, I think, veterinarians. I think we, it's over 100 because we, oh, we're, getting, we're getting a few every week now. And, and this is pretty amazing. I mean, uh, Paul can speak to this more, more than I can, but when we started there, there really weren't many vets supporting us. I think there was one or two. <laughs> No, um, and the reason, uh, yeah, you know, not to blame the veterinary community, but they don't get training in school about nutrition, neither the human doctors, by the way. Right. But the nice thing about what I've seen over the years, more students, they're saying, wait a minute, we want to learn about nutrition. So they're getting electives so they can learn about nutrition, which is pretty cool. Yes, the, the recipes we're recommending at, at Keto Pet are to treat dogs with multiple issues, cancer being one of them. So you treat that, as Patrick says, if you've got a dog that's on, on the, le you know, the level two for four months, then you stop it. The idea is to knock out, in the terms of keto pet, the reason I keep saying keto pet, because visionary, and I'll talk about it in a minute, you want to knock out that cancer. Visionary, keto pet can say a lot of things. We have a lot of science, we have a lot of oncologists and veterinarians and experience, a, a big pool of people there that we can talk right. about. Visionary pet can't say anything. If you want information, go to Keto Pet. Why? Because what, I, what we don't want is making medical claims. We can't have that. We cannot make claims. The only reason we've got visionary, one, to fund Keto Pet, but two, because there was no low-carb keto diet out there. Um, at the end of the day, you've got your veterinary community. You've got your veterinarians. You listen to what they have to say. You have to insert yourself into those conversations and think, What's right for my dog? And then look at your dog and make the best decision. At the end, of, a, lot, a lot of vets say, hey, it's food. Try it. It's not going to hurt, which is a good, it is food, right? So mm -hmm. that's where we're at with that. Um, well, so two things. The um, visionary pet, do you have, well, actually, let me start with the, the keto pet calculator. If I want to do it myself, should I be adding um, a vitamin and mineral supplement um, should I be adding calcium? Are there things, extra things, or should I just be starting with the base diet for those first two weeks? And then if I do have, my pet does have cancer, then I move to the um, level two for what, 120 days? And then after that, worry about balance, or should I be balancing some of it right from the get-go? It'll be balanced the entire time. So we have a, a mineral supplement actually in the results page that you can click on to and purchase. Okay. And that's one that we recommend, but you could find one with similar amounts. Um, yeah, it, it'll be balanced. There's no issues there. And calcium is the number one thing that you need to make sure that you add into the food, right? A calcium supplement. Yeah, and that, that's the most prominent ingredient in the supplement that we recommend. Yeah. Okay. And then the other thing that I wanted to ask about is I had read that sometimes uh, when you go from a conventional diet to a ketogenic diet, you can lose a lot of uh, water. Um, and so maybe adding a little bit of salt to your dog's diet uh, would be good. And yeah. I know a lot of people want to know, is it a teaspoon? Is it a pinch? I mean, can you overdo it? Um, that kind of stuff. Yeah, you just, you just salt the food for the first few days and, and that tends to help. That tends to just be like enough. humans. Yeah. Well, just like humans, humans, sometimes when they go keto, they notice they're getting dizzy or they're tired and you'll add a mineral supplement or you'll just add some salt to the food and you'll see that go away right away. Did you guys see a transition time uh, or a transition period for the dogs as you move them from um, a conventional kibble or even canned into the ketogenic diet? Was there any changes? Do they have the same kind of keto flu that people get? <laughs> That's a good question. That is a good question. 
Uh, you yeah. Answer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We get that keto flu question a lot. We haven't seen anything like that in dogs. For, to be honest, the only issue with transition that we've ever seen is sometimes you can get gastrointestinal issues if a dog is coming from a very high carb diet and then going straight to keto. And that's simply just because they're going to lose a lot of glucose and that's going to pull a lot of water. And when you have water in the digestive tract, you, you can have some, some things you don't want. So uh, a typical transition, like you're going to any new food, is, is what we recommend. Some people like to go right away because they don't want a period where they are feeding high fat and high carbs at the same time, which can happen with the transition. So if, if you can do it right away, go ahead. But um, this is not something we're hard and fast on. This is a do what makes sense for your dog. What we, you know, traditional guidance is that 10 to 14 day window. Maybe some people go faster and some people just do it overnight. Um, it really just depends. Sometimes people will transition right away, see a little GI issues. And so, okay, let me try it a little slower. And uh, yeah, it's not an exact science there. And you have, well, you have pumpkin as an option for, I know that's a high carb, but as you're transitioning, it might be okay. It can help sometimes, to help yeah. Chia seeds, right? That helps. Yeah, chia seeds, oh, that's okay. in the calculator. We have an exact yeah. recommendation there. Um, yeah, all those things. And, and like with supplements and herbs, like we talked about Union Bio, sometimes these things are entirely carbohydrate based, right? But it's not going to ruin your ketogenic diet because the amount gram wise is so low. Yeah, I think some people, when I've talked to them about ketogenic diets, they they worry um, that one thing is going to throw the, their dog out of balance. So um, that actually brings me to another point, and then I'll come back to the visionary pet foods first. As you go through the, the diet, do you usually recommend, let's just, so the dog has cancer, I need at least 120 days to try and uh, affect a major change on this. So during that time, should I not use treats? Should I not feed bones? Should I just kind of try and stick to the diet? And then once I achieve the goal of either remission or slowing the disease, then should I look at maybe adding organ meats or bones or um, what, maybe using some of the dog's meals to actually create treats? Uh, how do you move forward in a practical way with that? Yeah. So the easiest sort of rule of thumb here is you, you can, you can add things, you can use treats, just don't use treats with a high amount of digestible carbs. So there's plenty of single source protein treats that don't have carb content. Um, you can use a ketogenic prepackage. You can use maybe our dry food um, or freeze dried. Um, there, there's a lot of things you can add. You can add organ meats, you can add bones. That's not going to affect the carbohydrate content. Maybe it'll lower the fat percentage a tiny bit, but um, there, there's plenty of flexibility. Um, the only rule is don't add a significant amount of digestible carbs. And most things have nutrition labels, especially if you're sourcing the food yourself. So it's pretty easy to tell. Oh, that's nice. That's nice yeah. to know. Yeah, I was going to say, Melissa, what I do at home, um, I have three dogs, two rescue poodles and an Irish setter, um, Kobe, who, by the way, ever since a puppy, had really bad GI issues. I mean, as dog owners, Melissa, we're expert on poop, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> the poop, the poop score. Um, <laughs> so, um, I got involved in this with keto. And he's been fine ever since, which is kind of interesting. But what we do at home, I look at the total food intake for the day, which includes treats, and. Um, I actually dehydrate my own chicken with rosemary at home for the doggies, but you know, we'll use one protein source treat. Visionary Pets just come out with a treat, so we'll do that now. Um, but yeah, we just look at the total consumption. And um, look, sometimes I'll, look, it's like humans on keto. Sometimes you'll have a bit of chocolate or a cookie, and people do panic. They go, oh my God, you know, it's, it's yeah. fine, it's fine. But the good thing about this diet, and, and pet owners can do it, some do, most won't. You can in the dog's lip, take a little prick, put it on your little glucose meter, glucose meter and, and see the glucose level. What we try, what I typically do, we just take a baseline, do it one time, the vet will do it, get the baseline glucose and maybe have it done, you know, once or two times over and you'll see the glucose coming down. You're on the right track. You don't need to be pricking your dog every day. Um, right. But uh, yeah, so treats are fine. We love to give dogs treats, you know, when they're good or out walking, it makes us happy, makes them happy. But do look at treats as an overall of the daily consumption of food. Okay. And then when you were talking, so at the end of the 120, 
120 day period, then you can kind of go back to the one to one for a little bit. Um, but if, if do you kind of recommend uh, fluctuating, go stay one to one for a little bit, but um, then go back to the two to one, or do you wait for potential symptoms to arise before doing that? Yeah, I would say unless there's um, you know serious disease present, the option one, the option one diet is the one to stay with. Is good. Okay, perfect. And, and even if you want to up the protein a few days a week, that 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 would actually be something we recommend for a healthy dog. And now, when you say up the protein, is there a certain percentage that you end up doing? No, nah, there's no exact science there. It's simply you can just add some lean meat or reduce some of the fat if you're doing a diet that that has uh, the fat content added. But it's it's pretty easy. That's just I think something. When we, you get a when you get a person that's so you know people want to be regimented. Yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. You got you you've you've just spent all this time weighing and measuring. You're like yeah. What if I add too much? But back and I'm telling that. you, I just add some, you know. <laughs> well, and if you're concerned about it, Paul, you brought up a good point. You just test their glucose. If you if you see a spike, yeah. maybe that's too much for your dog, right? And um, I will link the videos that you have about how to take um, the the blood uh, measurements. Um, I'll make sure that people can see that there are different options. I know that the lip the pad and the elbow, I think, were, were three places that you demonstrated. <laughs> yeah, and the ear's another one. I don't, I use the lip because the dog hardly feels it. And I don't, have you ever oh. taken your dog's glucose? It's a tiny little needle. Right. So I, again, with an iris set of big jowls, right? I just lift up the lip, poke, you get a nice straight away. I mean, it's not jabbing, it's just a little, just squeeze it and you get the blood straight away. You get a nice, I like the lip. I don't like this part. If you have a 250 pound Mastiff <laughs> trying to get a little needle in that big, you know, leathery. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's not, yeah, it's not going to work for you. Um, I don't like the pads of the feet for the same reason. They're thick. I, the reason I don't like the ear is because you, with fur in the ear, you, you get that cap capillary action going down. So as soon as you prick it, the hair takes it. Psh, and then you've got nowhere to. <laughs> so for me, the best place is the lip. Now, of course, around the underneath the lips are teeth, so you have to be careful right. that the dog <laughs> doesn't bite you. Um, but your vet will do it. Um, you, yes, yeah. please show that video. That's Amber, our vet tech, doing doing the doing the blood. I mean, she's doing it all the time. That's what she's used to. For pet owners like myself, you think well, you know, but you do it once or twice, and you get used to it. Or just go to your vet. Yeah. Please don't get obsessive over it for the people that are weighing out. If you want to do it, take a baseline. Oh, my dog's glucose is 120. And the vet will say, oh, that's perfect. No, it's not. Our dog, our dogs run around 50 or 60. And the vet will say, oh, we need to give him glucose. It's too low. No, it's not. It's fine. You don't need to give him glucose. Um, but you can test it. I test my dogs. To be honest, I don't do it very often now, maybe once a month. But um, um, yeah, that, I mean, that's a great way. And then ketone levels, they can actually fluctuate. Like with people, you actually see higher levels than you do with your dogs, right? So if I tested my dog and they were at, what's the minimum level that you, that would be acceptable? Or is it a combination of the glucose and the, um, the ketone levels together that tell you if they're in ketosis? Yeah, it's going to be a combo. So glucose, you definitely want to see it generally like under 80 is good, but you can see it as low as 40 something sometimes um, with deep wow. ketosis. Um, and ketones, yeah, dogs, we were a little more lenient. They, they tend to have lower ketone values. So you want to see it kind of above 0 0.2, 0 0.3, right there would sort of be the beginning of ketosis there for dogs when you're pairing that with the below 80 glucose value. Perfect. That's that's kind of what you want to see. Some dogs are higher. Perfect. Um, and then back to visionary pet food. So there, it's yeah. ready to go. Okay. Yeah, so it's ketogenic out of the bag. Perfect. And if you want to do the option two with it, there's a prepackaged option in the, in the keto pet calculator too, where you would add fat. So basically with visionary, sorry, I was just going to explain with the, with, mm -hmm. with the uh, patties, we have, uh, I speak with my hands, <laughs> like an Italian, I'm not, I'm English. Um, the patties are what we fed a keto pet. The, the frozen patties, the six ounce and the, uh, uh, sorry, the eight ounce and the one ounce sliders. Then we made a freeze dried version of that. Then we thought, well, wait a minute, 
frozen and freeze dried expensive items. We wanted anybody that wants to feed a ketogenic diet, low carb keto diet for their dogs should be able to feed it and afford to feed it. So then we took, what was it, a couple of years back, maybe closer to three now, we had the conversation where we mentioned the K word, should we try and do kibble? And we said, no, there's no way we would feed our dogs kibble. Well, wait a minute. What happens if we can make a kibble with no carbohydrates in it? And maybe, maybe. So I started to look around, couldn't find anybody. Oh, we can, you know, to your point, how's it gonna, how's it gonna bind? You're gonna have to bake it, which I didn't, because be, they wanna bake it, that'd be more expensive. So anyway, long story short, we found a recipe that what we use to bind the kibble instead of starch is egg white, whole egg, and gelatin. Most of the heavy lifting in that binding, because when you extrude, it comes out in a long rope, and then they cut it into the various sizes uh, or whatever shape. The egg white's doing the heavy lifting. So we thought, oh, that's it. We do put miscanthus grass in there. That's not really binding, but it's a fiber source. Um, and you can see the ingredient deck, deck. It's, it's, it's very, it's a small ingredient deck. So we came out with a beef and a chicken. We'll come out with some other proteins. We've just come out with a treat. We basically took the food, the, the dry food, the kibble, took out some things that make it a food to put into the treat. Um, and that was harder because the treat's bigger. So we're, we're just tweaking that. We have it on the market now, but that's what we used. And it was really the first innovation in dry food for 60 years. Companies have been used to been making the same brown and round for years and years and years with no innovation. So it is a food now where I'm happy and my business partner, Patrick doesn't have a dog yet, but we'll, we'll get him there. Feed, so we'll, one of our dogs likes to dry, mix with the raw. Another dog likes to dry, mix with the freeze dried. So it gives people different options and we're happy to feed, at least I am, my dogs that way, which is, you know, it's, <laughs> we own the company, so you would say that, but you know, if I dogs, I wouldn't, I would not feed a dry food to my dog. I wouldn't feed anything to my dog if I thought I was going to do it harm. So that, right. we've come, we've come full circle. So, um, did you use any of those foods, um, it with your test subjects? Well, the, fr the frozen patties were the keto food. So, you know, I was saying it took four hours a day. Right. Yeah. We said, well, let's just take that. Now, some dogs are on different meds too, but just take the basic food right. and make that. So that's what we did. So the frozen patties were what we fed the keto pet dogs and, and still, still do. And then we thought, well, if you're traveling, people aren't, some people aren't gonna want to worry about frozen and getting their hands in raw meat. So that's why we took the frozen, made it smaller same recipe, but um, we freeze dry, which is, you know, so we have the freeze dried option. And you guys, we never, you, we never fed kibble. We never fed kibble because we didn't have one. <laughs> and you also, you guys have tested your foods, right? So uh, I've always wondered, is freeze dried um, comparable to a fresh once you add the water? I mean, you're not, I've always wondered if, you, if you're losing some nutrients. Um, no. In the, uh, no. Okay, that's great to know. No, we did test it. We thought uh, people say, "Oh, well, it, you know, if you freeze dry, it, you've cooked it, and it's not raw anymore. You're not really cooking it." I mean, the, the, our freeze dries get up to about 120. I mean, my little chicken di dehydrator at home is at 165. So, to my point, it's it is still raw. I mean, it, it, you know, so you're not cooking it 120. I don't think you can even have a setting on an oven at your home. I think the lowest is what 175. So it's in the dryer, and um, yes, as soon as you rehydrate it, it's to all intents and purposes the same as the raw product. We've done testing on what does it do to the proteins and the minerals and so on and so forth, um, just as we have with kill steps with high pressure, pro high pressure processing. Does that do anything? We don't use HPP, but it does nothing to the proteins. People say, oh, you can't use HPP. Have you heard of that in the raw industry to get rid of pathogens? Um, Melissa, have you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't. We had scientists look at it and it doesn't. Uh, well, this is great though, because a lot of times we have these questions, but you don't, it's, you're unique in the fact that you, you've, you've created a pet food, but you've also, 
you know, you've done the testing because you were doing the, you were trying to, to see how it was working as part of your, uh, what would you call it? Well, it's a validation of the dogs. Oh, yeah, just, okay. yeah, just validation. People get freaked out by the word research, apart from scientists, they don't. It's one of those trigger words. Oh my God. Uh, you know, so it is research, but we were validating a diet. We didn't want peer reviewed science and have IA cooks. And as Patrick said, have you control group, you know, any dog that was sick that was going to be euthanized, just bring, and this is just around Texas, just bring them in. Yeah. If we can make them better, um, if we can, great. If they don't have cancer, heal whatever they've got going on and send them back to the, you know, the rescue or, or the shelter to be adopted out. Um, yeah, we did, as I said, close to, we've been going on seven years. Really, the ranch was like four years of validating this food before we launched a pet food company. I mean, that no pet food company in the history of pet food companies has done that. The validation really right. is like a three week test. <laughs> yeah. does, it, has a do does the dog eat it? Does it have diarrhea? Yes, it eats it, it doesn't have diarrhea. Okay, you're good. Yeah, it's I don't bit... think people understand how, how a little bit loose that is. Yeah, and just to go back to one thing, when you said it took four hours to prep your food, you're feeding multiple dogs, right? You're feeding how many at for four we had, hours? We had about, we probably had about uh, 40 okay. at the maximum, but we had staff. I'm just saying everybody's in there working. Yeah, I just didn't want a pet parent who's listening to this for the first time thinking that it's going to take them four hours to oh, no, no, put no, together no, we, their diet. Yeah. No, unless... You have a listener that has 40 dogs, so it wouldn't matter if you just got one dog. It's well, I shouldn't <laughs> shake <it>. Yeah. <laughs> if people have um, some concerns about using the raw food while they're doing chemotherapy or radiation, um, did you do that with the dogs that were at the Keto Pet Sanctuary? Were they getting a raw diet during chemo and radiation? If you use that for a yeah. particular dog? We did. I, I know, Patrick, you may want to touch on this if, if you know that putting you on the spot. Yeah, we, we get yep. a lot of questions like that. Um, we've never had any issues with sort of like bacterial negative aspects of bacteria. Dogs seem to handle most bacteria really well. Um, yeah, the, the, the reason we recommended raw to start with is there's a lot of concerns with high fat and pancreatitis, and that's still a question we get to yeah. date. Um, what we've kind of come to believe here, uh, based on all this experience, was, was that it's not fat content specifically, but it's peroxidized or damaged fats. And the way you get that is by heating up certain types of fats, um, mono and polyunsaturated fats specifically. Um, and we've taken that into account. At, at Visionary, we test everything, and we haven't seen any difference in – you can actually measure lipid peroxidation, and we haven't seen any difference between – uh, the dry food and the raw and the freeze dried, um, specifically because we take that into account in the process. We add the unsaturated fats after the heat step. The heat step is low anyway. Um, but yeah, people come to us all the time and we've had people feed really high fat diets and they lightly cook it and that's fine. We just say, don't, don't cook the fats. So don't cook the butter or that you're adding, even though that's saturated, but definitely don't cook the coconut oil if you're choosing that. Um, and then with the meat source, just use a light heat setting and we haven't had any issues there. Oh, that's nice. And um, now there's some talk lately that coconut oil is bad for dogs because of the, is it the lauric acid? Have you guys used that the, as part of your protocols, right? So you didn't, did you see any adverse effects with using it? No, no, okay. not at all. And we ask, you know, people, you, know, you can mix the fats up, you know, dogs get like humans get sick of the same thing. So, you, you know, you have different choices of fats that you can use. So we do suggest that, but no issues with coconut. You can create a ketogenic diet with all sorts of ingredients. Um, right. We can't possibly create a calculator that includes all of them. And we'll have people come to us with exotic requests. Um, can you, you know, that I have a problem with the calculator. It doesn't include um, salmon from Ohio. And, and we, I really want to do that. And so it's sort of like you can create a diet with, with all sorts of ingredients. But we, we chose three options for each um, just to make it easy for everyone. But, of course, if you understand it and the Facebook group is helpful for this, you, you can substitute all sorts of things. Right. Okay. But it is the cook fats. If you look at your know, holiday times in America and England, you know, wherever I'm from, uh, thank, uh, at Christmas time and here Thanksgiving time, that's the biggest increase of pancreatitis and illness in pets because of the table scraps and all the cooked fats. That's why bacon fat, you know, 
it's not good. Right. And most and of the time amounts. when you're giving that, you're adding that to probably a kibble or a canned food, not somebody so, who's already getting a fresh food diet where you've exactly. got maybe a little more variety in there. Yeah. Um, and have you all used CBD with your um, with your dogs? Because I see it mentioned on almost every single response to cancer treatment. And um, I, I just wondered if you had any experience with No, that. no. I mean, it's like in humans, right? The CBD, it's like it cures everything. Yeah, that's the line right there. We haven't directly studied it, um, but you know, there's plenty of positive anecdotes there, so there there could very easily be some benefits. Um, and then the DCM. I noticed that in another webinar that I saw you in, you had mentioned that DCM. The idea behind the low carb was yeah. not the cause of that. Yeah, I can touch on that really quickly. So that's a really confusing thing for pet parents and something that we should definitely talk about. So there was a, it was an FDA report, right? That they announced a link between grain-free foods and uh, dilated cardiomyopathy or DCM. And they actually specifically named some grain-free foods, I believe. So grain-free is, is one aspect to describe a food. It doesn't really tell you much about that food, except that the food doesn't have grains. It doesn't tell you anything about the carb content. There's all sorts of carbs that aren't grains. Um, doesn't really tell you anything about the fat or protein content. It doesn't tell you anything about the ingredients, except there's not grains. So classifying a link between grain-free and something is is pretty irresponsible and obviously misleading just because there's so many things that grain-free can be. And and to link it to something is, is very disingenuous, in my opinion. So the problem with some grain-free foods is that they use inferior protein sources. Now, there's plenty of foods that have grains that use these protein sources, like pea or soy protein, um, that don't include adequate amount of taurine. So taurine is an amino acid. It's present abundantly in heart muscle. If you don't eat enough of it, um, you can get issues like uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, um, specifically seems to be more common in dogs um, with a taurine-deficient diet. So that was the problem. Some grain-free foods are deficient in taurine. Um, there's not an exact mechanism of action, but it's abundant in heart muscle. So, you know, obviously something related to that, you get dilated cardiomyopathy. So, you know, our food is grain-free. It also is incredibly low in carbs and has, you know, probably as, as much taurine, if not more than any other food on the market, just because it's mostly meat. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a link between grain-free. It's a link between taurine deficient, in my opinion. I also think people don't realize they think meat is just one thing, but meat has vitamins and, and uh, amino acids. Oh, yeah. 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 If you were on a desert island and you can only pick one food, um, you know, 80 20 beef is a pretty good answer. <laughs> That'd be great. Or an egg. An egg, yeah. Yeah. Both of those. Yeah. It's very hard to get to the truth of anything in the world anymore, to be honest. Well, you can prove yourself wrong or you can prove yourself right, you know, yes. with an internet search. So yeah, it, that's, that's part of the reason why I started this podcast was to bring a lot of that out because, you know, when that DCM stuff hit, um, I actually thought, well, you know, you have to prepare um, lentils and beans and things like that in a certain way so they don't cause people problems were the manufacturers actually prepping those materials in that way were those foods more fish based so d does fish have a lot of taurine you know like you said Patrick I think that there was just um so many components to it that I kind of just stepped back um but I do recognize that a lot of pet parents were like well I spent all this time and energy looking for this particular grain-free food now what do I do? You know, and, and there really wasn't a lot of guidance out there, but you've explained it very nicely. And I think that helps a great deal. Well, when you were doing the ketogenic diet for these dogs, did you see that there were other side benefits to the diet? Like, you know, I mean, I know you were treating them primarily for cancer, <clears throat> but did any of them have secondary issues that you were like, oh my gosh, look at that, that cleared up. Yeah, first thing, and, and people say it all the time to us, skin allergies, coat looks shiny, more energy, more life, and kind of vibrance in the dog. Say less anxiety, too. A lot of dogs that couldn't yeah. be kept in crates, and now they can be kept in crates or hang out in, in loud, high-stimulus environments, which, which I think that, that aspect is the same reason it works for epilepsy is because ketones can influence um, neurotransmitters in the brain. Oh, nice. That's a yeah. good point. Yeah, I never thought about that. Although we had a poodle, I seem to have 
the history of um, adopting rescuing dogs with medical issues. So one of our poodles had really bad seizures, put them on a ketogenic diet, never seized again. Because uh, yeah, if you look at carbs, I think of carbs of inf as inflammation. We know as humans, when we have stuff we shouldn't eat, we feel, you know, like inflamed right. <laughs> inside. So I think of carbs in a dog as inflammation. The amount of stories we've had, where we had one little Frenchy, Patrick, I think, uh, was chewing his feet off because he was so allergic to, you know, just where they were bleeding. Oh my. He's, he's, he's fine now. You know, just get rid of all the junk they're not supposed to be eating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not quite sure why people feel like it's a pill that you should be taking to create health when it's what you put in your body first that determines your health. I mean, I try and eat low carb, but I will tell you if I have, if I have some carbs for a couple of days, Actually, the first thing that changes for me, besides getting a puffy face, is my the way I think about myself. I start yes. to be a little more, a little less confident, a little more self-conscious. And I'm like, what? You know, what's changed between two days ago and today? And that was the ice cream and maybe the pizza that I had. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's kind of interesting. But if you don't pay attention, you know, to those things that you don't recognize um, well, that's great to know that there were some other things that took place with the diet. That's fantastic. Oh, sure. I mean, it, 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 there's there's a clear mechanism of action there too. Um, ketones cross the blood brain barrier and they do influence um, neurotransmitters, which is what gives you that effect in epilepsy and seizure control. You know, I forgot to ask one question about when you were formulating the diet. Um, I know that they have exogenous ketones for people. Did you use any exogenous ketones for the dogs and are there safe ones out there? I think, well, we're, and I'll let Patrick dive into exogenous ketones, but when we formulated the food, even with the humans, we, we said, we, you know, it should be the liver producing the ketones, not, 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 not try and cheat your way into ketosis. Our, our sort of party line with dogs is you don't really need to add them if you're feeding the diet correctly. Um, as long as their glucose is low, and they are producing ketones in the blood. Not urine, right? Urine strips, not very effective. No, because, okay. not a good measurement. Okay, all right. So stick with the blood. Glucose, yes. ketone levels. Perfect, excellent. So where are you guys going from here? You... I, think, I think for me, the world, and it sounds kind of corny, but the world will tell us what it needs to be. Is it just an education center? Is there a new disease coming that we can look at? Is uh, um, With cancer, we've got enough information. We've got more than enough information. I'd like to see Keto Pet move to everything else out there. It's like Visionary Pet. We're not a cancer food by any stretch. But let's look at other stuff that's impacting dog health and wellness and longevity. It goes back to why isn't your dog living to mid-teens? I mean, the amount of people, oh, my dog's 10. I was so lucky to get it to 10. Yeah, I see, it shouldn't be like that. So there's going to be other things that we can look at. Um, I will pitch if you wanted to look into working with DCM. I actually happened to be watching um, Tom Bilyeu and he had Don Diagostino on and Don mentioned that in mouse models, the profuse heart and I may not I may not be putting these words in the right place takes up ketones before glucose. And because he said that, it triggered me to look into a few things. And anyway, my father had congestive heart failure. He had 28% ejection fret, left-sided ejection fraction. We put him on a ketogenic diet, and now he has 40% ejection fraction just from diet alone. So, you wow. know, I, and a lot of these DCM dogs are just sitting and kind of I don't want to say waiting to die, but honestly, on the list that I'm on, it really kind of seems like that. Like the yeah. medical interventions don't really have a way to um, to bring that heart back to give it the fuel it needs. Right. Um, so that would also, I'd vote for that. <laughs> That's what you kind of offer too here is hope. I mean, you've done the right. testing, you've got the experience, you've created um, an easy way for me to do it myself if I want to do that, or you have right. a product that I can use to make it. And even if it doesn't cure them, because everybody does die 
it, whether you're a dog, a plant, a human, anything. And so, but the thing that you've offered is the ability to give them that better quality of life for as, as long as possible, which I should wrap up on that, but I want to ask a real quick question. If people do not feel comfortable with the raw aspect of this diet, would it harm them to lightly cook it or fully cook it? Would you still get the same benefit from it for the most part? Yeah, it's okay. They can lightly cook. We wouldn't recommend using a high heat setting, but uh, lightly cooking is okay. We haven't seen any adverse effects there. Okay, perfect. So thank you, because that's, that's what I think is that you've, you've offered people hope that they didn't have before to, to give their dog the best quality of life, really, no matter what diagnosis. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for being here. Is there anything that uh, you guys might have wanted to have shared that we haven't touched on before we go? No, not from my side. I think I've covered everything. I'm going you had some really, obviously done some research. That book you picked up has been read fingered through the little sticky bits so that was great yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so that's cool um no i think i think from my point i'm, I'm good i appreciate being on thanks for having yeah oh, same really appreciate so it that was thank a great line of questions so much yeah cool perfect excellent thank you melissa so how many of you are like stop talking missy i gotta go get my 80 20 hamburger and get my dog started and that's fantastic since every single cell in your body is made from what you eat, whether you're a dog or a human, the diet you feed can affect such a major change. So I really do encourage people to look into this further. If you still have some questions, reach out to the veterinarians on the links below. If you need some more professional help or your own veterinarian, if they're open to this type of thing. And if you have liked this episode, please hit the like button. If you haven't already, please subscribe and stay happy.